Sarah Jane Clark is a highly respected entrepreneur, best known as the co-founder of the highly successful fashion house Assassin Bide. She has dressed some of the biggest names in the world with the likes of Beyonce, Madonna, and Kim Kardashian. Having co-founded denim label Assassin Bide and receiving Order of Australia for her significant service to the Australian fashion industry, in 2018, Clark launched her eponymous lifestyle brand, Sarah Jane Clark. Please welcome the lovely Sarah Jane Clark. Yeah, so um, you know, welcome, welcome onto the you know onto the podcast, and I wanted to um, you know obviously talk to you about uh, your journey to um, to the to the top of the fashion industry in in essence. Um, you know where where did you um, you know where, I'm sure when you were a child, like when you're five or six years old. You didn't uh, uh, want to become a, uh, you know, owner of an amazing label. Mm. What did you want to be when you uh, when you were growing up? Or unless, of course, that is what you wanted to be. Well, my mother tells me that I really wanted to be a mini race dri- a, a racing driver of, of a minis, and I think that stems back from um, my father always taking us to. Um, the racetrack when I when I was growing up, so I think that's where that inspiration came from. Um, and then probably in later in my later years, um, I did start thinking about fashion, and I then wanted to become a window. Back then, you used to call them window dresses. You know, they they yeah. dress the mannequins for display. So that's when I first probably started to think that fashion might be for me. That's great. So um, what did your parents do? Um, Oh, so my parents were, uh, they, uh, my father was a surveyor, a town planner. Mm -hmm. And my mother, she actually worked with my father. So she was... I don't know, I guess back then you'd call them almost the secretary receptionist yeah, sure. office office girl. So they were um, always, dad has always been, you know, entrepreneur. Mm. Both my parents um, set out and started their own business together. So um, that's what they did. And wow. So you grew up in uh, Brisbane and um, your parents were town planners. So yeah. very, very far um, away from the, you know, fashion Yes, from the glamorous fashion. lifestyle of the fashion girl. I think um, my parents, uh, they, even though they were in that industry of town planning um, and my mother, I mean, she worked there really by default because, you know, they just yeah. decided to team up and um, work together in it. But... Uh, my mum, both my parents always had a really good style and they were really good with colour. So I always, um, I really like colours and putting colours together and um, they really affect me and my mood. So I would say that my parents taught me a lot about colour mm-hmm. and colour palettes. Um, so... Yeah, they they were always very house proud, and they you know they loved renovating, and they're very um, like to they're very authentic to design. So if we were in living in a sort of older house, they'd they'd always try to keep it very um, to to the I don't know essence of what um, that you know the house was like yeah. at the time. <laughs> Did you grow up with any siblings? Yeah, I grew up with two brothers, older. Oh, yeah. One's four years older and one's two years older. Mm-hmm. So I came from very sort of dominant um, male house, I would say, you know, back then in the, yeah. I was born in the 70s. Mm-hmm. So it was always, you know, very, uh, quite a traditional household. And um, my, I, you know, my father was probably the dominant uh, feature. Of, yeah. of the house. It yeah. was sort of like his way or the highway. <laughs> God bless him. But, yeah. yeah. So you, you would have had to be pretty strong, you know, being the youngest and the girl. Uh, and, you know, you had to stand up to your brothers and your dad in, in some ways. Yeah, you do get a um, – I guess being the only girl has that 
lovely element of balancing all that male energy. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, look, I guess my brothers did make me, um, I, I was quite a tomboy, you know. Mm-hmm. They used to put me in cardboard boxes and I was, <laughs> we'd play Doctor Who and I was always the Dalek. And yeah, yeah. So we, yeah, I was definitely playing a lot more boys' games than I was uh, girly Barbies and that sure. type of thing. So um, when did your first, you know, um, inkling of uh, wanting to be in fashion uh, start? You know, was it in, you know, primary school? Was it in high school? Mm, look, I always um, loved getting dressed mm-hmm. and dressing for the day and dressing for the mood and using colour. And then I had the fortunate meeting of meeting Heidi Middleton, who was the co- uh, my co-founder, co-partner in Sassenbide. So um, I guess we got together in Brisbane. So we were both at university and we would meet at lunchtime to talk about uh, what we were going to wear to the party that was coming up on the weekend. (laughs) So we did spend a lot of time discussing outfits, which then led on to us um, making, going down to our local tailor and we would get these little twin sets made. Like I'd get the pink set, she'd get the blue (laughs) set. So I guess that that was where it started, Started, that we both had shared this sort of um, love of fashion and and the whole process of getting dressed and put together. You you obviously met um, Heidi in high school and I hear that, uh, you know, you guys met through your then boyfriends. Yes, yeah. we did. We our two lovely Greek boyfriends <coughs> at the time. Um, <coughs> excuse me. That's okay. Um, so <coughs> we, yes, I, I had, I was dating somebody mm-hmm. for quite a long time, like five or six years, and then she started going out with his best friend. And so that is how we met. Wow, and that... that um and that relationship obviously um, flourished. flourished. And the boys disappeared. Yeah. Wow. Um, so you, you know, you you said once you wore a black velvet um, to the knee, uh, long, long sleeve dress to your formal. Oh, gosh, yes. I My mum sent me a picture of that uh, only this week. So it's funny that you're... <laughs> bringing that up because I haven't seen a picture like that. It was it wasn't just black velvet. It was black velvet skin tight to the knee, but then it was also um had this big love heart cut out of it mm. on the chest and then it had all these gold hearts hanging off the dress everywhere around the dress. So I was really like a Christmas a Christmas tree with baubles. Wow. And I thought that was just fabulous. <laughs> Did it get a pretty amazing reaction when you turned up to the uh, form? Oh, yeah. I mean, people loved it. It was definitely probably the most different dress there was there. And I guess that's the other thing. I always knew I dressed slightly differently from my peers and um, that definitely stood out. Yeah, so that photo would have brought back some memories for you. You know, um, do you still have that dress? Well, the story of that dress is that it, I did keep it for such a long time and then my mum actually wore it to a, oh, wow. a ball up in Montville when because my mum and dad move, they're like these grey-haired gypsies and they, every 10 years they do this big life change move. So they moved up um, to a property outside of Rockhampton and mum ended up wearing it to the Montville. Montville? Anyway, some ball up there. And then now I don't know where it is. Ah, that was your first, you know, statement piece, right? It was. It is. Well, still is, yes. Yeah. So, um, you know, you and Heidi, um, what what made you guys click, you know, straight off the bat? Because you meet lots of people in high school and, you you know, and – Friendships kind of um, 
form and then disband later on because, you know, you you move on to different things. What yeah. made you guys, you know, um, so stick tight? Together. Yeah, stick together. And so, so um, well, I guess I was instantly attracted. She was quite mischievous and she had a little bit of drama going on with, with her sort of relationships at that stage. So I was quite attracted to that. <laughs> and, um, and then it just, it just became, it became deep, deeper in the sense that we we're both Sagittarius. We both loved to travel. We we're both very optimistic. Um, we shared sort of a, a very similar life values. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we also shared this vision to create a brand and, um, and we thought, well, why not? You know, we we didn't limit a, limit ourselves. So we we sort of we didn't. It was quite organic to how we decided to start that business. It wasn't. Um, it just sort of came naturally. You know, we spent a lot of time going to when we live. So we lived in London together in um, ninety seven to ninety nine, and. We spent a lot of time over that period going to markets and yeah. sourcing vintage clothes and then we'd take them home and we'd adjust them to make them the perfect fit. Mm-hmm. And we got to the point at the end of that two years and we said, well, instead of in- adjusting all these, uh, um, uh, adjusting other people's clothes, why don't we just make the perfect yeah. pair of jeans or make the perfect fitting top? And that's really um, how it came about. Wow. So, you know, it was it wasn't like a decision that you guys just went. You know, let's do this ourselves. It was more like an evolution. Yeah, or, it, it really. Say? Yeah, I think it really did evolve. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, starting any business, it's all about timing, isn't it? And yeah, absolutely. It's just being at the right time, having and for each partner or person to be ready as well. Mm-hmm. Um, at that stage of life where they're, they're wanting to take on that responsibility. And we just felt like it was because we were moving back from London back to Sydney, we either had a choice of going to work for someone or we could give the business a try. Yeah. And we thought, well, let's give it a go. There's nothing to lose. We were mm. young. We, we, yeah. You know, we had no children. We had no sort of... We had no houses. We had no sort of financial um, constraints um, mm. holding us back. So we just thought, we'll give it a go. If all fails, we'll just repay, you know, split the loan and we'll repay, you know, half each and mm. go our own, you know, own ways if need be. But yeah. we didn't have to think of that. You... um you know, you said you started selling uh, clothes at the markets and obviously the, it's a really, you know, well-known story that you guys started selling um, at Portobello um, markets. markets yes. um, initially, what was the, you know, what was the reaction of people who bought your stuff? Did they, you know, straight away and immediately love it? Or, you know, was that difficult initially? Because, you know... Um, to go to the markets and start selling your own clothes mm. um, would have, I'm sure, met with some resistance, no? Well, um, I think what, what happened there is because we had, because we were visiting the markets so often, mm. we actually became really friendly with the storeholders. Yeah. So we were, when we decided to sell some pieces through there, at that stage it wasn't under the label Sass and Bite. It was sure. just under another uh, brand. I think we called it Folk um, just to give it a trial. So for us it was a real sort of moment of will other people like what we're doing or is it just us? Mm. So the markets gave us the confidence to um, push forward again after, you know, it was – it was um, people liked it and people bought them and we did sell out of the pieces we put in the market. Now, we weren't making lots and lots, but it mm-hmm. was just a good indication that people did like what they saw yeah. and um, they did end up buying it. So we um, felt like that was a good place just to um, 
dip our toe toe in the water and just see yeah, yeah. the response. Um, you, you guys obviously said, um, you just said um, you had some loans and I believe you guys found, you know, like an angel investor yes. at, at the time. Yeah. And, you know, that's that's always the difficulty with anyone starting a business is trying to get funding from somewhere, right? Yes. And how did you guys come across uh, this this gentleman and you know what what did you have to say to him to convince him to lend you some money yeah well actually our story was probably a little bit um less conventional but Mm. in because this gentleman ended up being um you know he's quite a well he was a super wealthy man Mm -hmm. and the amount that we asked for was very minor Mm. um in his sort of wealth. So, and he he regularly helped um, people to start businesses. Yeah, right. So, um, and because we had talked to him over the last sort of previous six months, he he and he knew us and he knew our style. He liked and he liked it. He mm-hmm. saw, oh, well, yeah, I'll back these two Aussie girls and see what they do with it. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't, you know, it was like 70 grand back then. So it was not a lot of money. Mm, um, mm, mm. But to your point, it is hard to raise money and you've mm. got to, you know, that is, I think, one big sort of hurdle for any entrepreneur is how to reach um, yeah. investors and, you know, actually, especially I think for a lot of women who aren't necessarily in the workforce and m- may have a great idea and want to start the business, but they just don't know how to link um, the idea with some investment and make mm. it happen. Yeah, I, um, you know, I help some, uh, you know, uh, some people who want to start their own business and some women, some um, men. And, you know, it's always difficult to try and help them um, uh, see that, you know, you've got to have something that grabs you know, nowadays you you got to go in front of people and start pitching, uh, mm. you know, your idea and you have to make an impact immediately. Um, and then if they're interested, then you can show them more. And and mm. so, you know, it's it's almost, um, uh, look, it's, it's definitely not um, a, as conducive to starting a business because you spend half of your time trying to prep for this bloody yes. pitch, right? Yes. So I guess in, you know, in many ways that you guys um, uh, managed to find someone who, you know, believed in you and just said, mm. hey, here's some money, go off and start. Yeah, we were lucky. Yeah. We were lucky. But well, it- I, I don't know if it's luck, but I think you kind of make your own luck in that sense. But, you know, yes. you guys well, also Well, I guess we good- saw the opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> and we weren't shy. Mm. You know, once again, I think it's just about being – a little bit bold and believing in what you're doing yeah. and knowing that if the first time it fails, it provides mm. a really good opportunity to, for you to go back and um, relook at your pitch, improve it, and mm. then go to the second round. And, you know, so you've, I, I think you've got to look at knockbacks as just a time to sort of hone your pitch pack and, and get that to perfection. Rather yeah. than getting deflated. Sure. Yeah. So you guys came back to, you know, came back to Sydney, decided that you were going to, got some funding, decided that you were going to start start a label. Mm. And, of course, you guys called it uh, Sass and Bide. Yes. Um, Sass being you. Yes. And Bide um, being Heidi. That's right. Now, can you... Um, Tell me uh, why uh, you guys had the nicknames Assassin Bide. Yes. Um, well, why we had? Well, look, the Sass just came from Sarah. Sarah, really, I guess. Sure. It's sa- I mean, a bit sassy, I like <laughs> to think. <laughs> and Bide is an old fam, an uh, old name that her, uh, that Hyde's dad used to call her. So uh-huh. it was um, Sass and Bide really came out of default because we had registered another name and uh, we got told that, you know, it wasn't available. What was the name? Oh, I know. What was the name? I, I, <laughs> I think it, 
Oh, look, we really wanted folk for yeah. a long time. And and then we were trying all other combinations, but we had like 24 hours to put in a new name or we'd lose our $100 sort of deposit on, you know, yeah. on the naming rights. So, of course, that was a lot of money to yeah, us. Yeah, totally. So we're like, okay, come on, we just have to think about a name that nobody has. Mm. And that's how um, Sass and Bide really formed. All in small letters. All in small letters. <laughs> So, um, you know, um, you you guys mentioned that, um, you know, in the first two years you really worked, you know, your, your little butts off uh, working seven days a week, um, having almost mm. no time off. Um, what did you guys do, you know, um, in that period? Well, I would like to think it's probably a little longer than two years. As anybody yeah. knows in a startup, it's um, – the, for the, well, for the first two years, you basically wear all the hats, don't you? From mm. sales to finance to, to, you know, design to PR to marketing. Yeah. So you really, luckily there was two of us so we could spread ourselves across all the roles that mm. were needed. Um, and then to pay ourselves. So on the weekend we would do the markets and we'd sell all our vintage clothes Um We'd go and source these vintage clothing out at Port Botany where they come in on on the boat. Mm. And so we'd go out there with masks on and we'd go through all the bags wow. of old, um, well, of all the secondhand clothes that came from around the world. And then we, so we'd make the selection and then we'd take them to the markets that weekend and we'd sell them and hopefully we were always fingers crossed that there was enough to pay the rent um, mm. you know, where we lived for um, that week. So um, for the first, yeah, th- three or four, five years, it was really intense but good in a way because you really know your business yeah. Um, yeah. inside out after that. Did you have like lots of little um, wins or lots of little setbacks during that time? You know, yeah, you I share think. share some of those? Oh, gosh. I mean, I think in business – it's a game of wins and losses and it's yeah, how how you deal with them, right? About, mm. you know, the positives are easy to deal with. It's how it's how you deal with um, the knockbacks mm. um, that is the important one. And I think because we always had each other, we always sort of felt supported, I guess, and we yeah. could just continue on and, you know, we'd just focus mm, mm, mm. on on all the wins that we did have. I mean, look, we we had so many, but the business was moving at such a fast pace. You, you, you know, you might have two minutes to sort of think about it, but then you just have to get on and move on with the next yeah. thing. Um, oh, but, you know, as, I don't know, we had we had some gigantic losses and then, yeah. And we had some gigantic wins, so um, so part of it, yeah. or part of the ride. Um, did you ever take any of those losses, you know, personally? Um, you know, did they hurt as well? I mean, I know that you said, you know, Heidi was there to back you, back you up and support you, and you were there obviously for her too. Yeah. I mean, surely some of those things, especially if you're working those hours, and then to have, you know, a bit of a major setback would have, um, you know, discouraged a lot of people. Uh, look, yeah, I think um, I think it comes back to just being sort of quite um, confident and certain within yourself. So, mm. I mean, we would have had setbacks at least daily if not weekly <laughs> because that's fashion. You yeah. Know? And you just can't take them personally, even though, yes, you might dwell on them like, you know, some pieces might have come in wrong and now you've got all this stock on hand that's mm-hmm. not right and you had such big hopes that they were your, your winning pieces yeah. and they were going to make you all this money and now you can't sell them. So, of course, it was disappointing, but what it does do is just makes you a if, um, ensure that whatever went wrong doesn't happen again and mm. it, it sort of makes you better at the game. Yeah, yeah. But, um, 
you know, we just, we never really dwelled too much on those losses because otherwise if you start thinking like that, you just, you get stuck down in the muddy waters rather yeah. than being sort of at the top of the bit more clearer mm. vision. Yeah, look, a lot of, um, you know, young designers and um, uh, and young people who want to make it into the fashion industry, mm. um, you know, they, they definitely would experience that. Um, and, you know, many, many of them don't make it. I'm sure many of them are talented and they just um, don't get to the top because, um, you know, they don't persist long enough perhaps and they mm. just get bogged down with... Um, you know, mm. someone said something or or someone influential said something bad or negative about, yeah. you know, their piece and all of a sudden they just go, well, maybe I'm not cut out, cut out for this, right? Yeah, you definitely need a, a thick skin because in it you are putting your designs out there and mm. you're going to have a whole lot of people that absolutely love it, but you're also going to have a whole lot of people mm. who will write negative things about it. And yeah. I think that's when you either have to decide not to read reviews or not to, <laughs> you know, like get yeah. somebody else in your team to respond to the critics. Otherwise, sure. and especially if you know that that really affects you mm. and affects your productivity and affects your sort of well-being, then there's nothing wrong with getting somebody else to sort of be the watchful eye across all the social media and mm. so so then you can just focus on what you do well and if that's designing or if that's you know running the business then that's sort of where you really should be spending most of your time on yeah mm. so you know during the first few years you guys were traveling and you know pitching to uh uh, magazines, I guess, or um, buyers even. Mm. Um, and of course, there's, you know, I guess your uh, most famous break uh, would be, big break would be, you know, when you guys were in New York tell, um, and ru- just by chance running into, obviously, Sarah Jessica Parker on set. Yes, yes. You know, tell me a bit Oh, we that. used to travel quite a lot. Um we would take where we would take the collection and we would sell it, um, whether that's in London or mm. Paris or New York or LA, wherever that was. So um, we'd probably do that up to four times a year. Wow! But we used to quite like doing that because yeah. um, we got to travel together and you know we'd be staying in nice hotels and it was a nice sort of break from being in the office. Mm. So. Um, that time with Sarah Jessica Parker, we had just gone to see, I think it was, we had a, a Barney's appointment. So we had all our bags, our, we must have been able to fit them in a suitcase for some reason. I don't know why we were walking with our suitcases. I can't remember that. But anyway, the point of the story was is that we, mm. um, we walked past the set yeah. of Sex in the City and that was in what the early noughties where it was really popular huge yeah huge and I had one of our denim jackets on Mm. and um we were like oh my god you know that's Sarah Jessica Parker we need to give her something of the collection actually sorry we didn't have our bags with us we just had we must have been going to Barney's to have a look at the clothes so we didn't have our collection with us we weren't carrying around the big suitcases thank goodness but um, we we walked past the set and we said, okay, we need to give her something. Um, so I ended up taking the jacket off my back and say, okay, let's just <laughs> give her this jacket. It's Sassen yeah. Let's give it to her. And um, we w- walked over where the security mm. were and we said, can, can you please give this jacket to Sarah Jessica Parker for us? And he said, okay, all right. So he walked over with, with the jacket and yeah. gave it to her. And being such a sort of fresh and bubbly and beautiful spirit she is, she was so excited and she was like, show me the girls. Who gave me this jacket? So then she came back over to the um, barricade where we had to stand behind and she was mm. like, oh, 
God, girls, this is so lovely of you. You know, tell mm. me about yourselves. Where are you from? And so we're like, you know, we're Sassenbai. We're from Sydney, Australia. And she's like, oh, my God, I want to see more. Mm. So we ended up, um, to cut the long story short, she ended up saying, well, tomorrow morning, can you come to my trailer at 10 o'clock? I want to look through all your collection. I need an outfit to mm. wear on season, you know, season four, episode 10. Can you... Um, I want to see what you've got. Wow. So that's, uh, we went the next day and she chose this sort of white mini skirt and this painted um, blue blouse and she ended up wearing it on the show. Wow. So, And the rest is history in that and sense. That's, and this was pre-social media. Mm-hmm. This, so you had to rely a lot on press and, you know, celebrities mm-hmm. and shows like that to Absolutely. get, um, your fashion out there. So that was a big deal and all the um, newspapers and Vogue and mm. here in Australia picked it up. So that really launched us into um, being a brand that had an underground swirl to being a brand that became a little bit more sort of recognised recognized globally. Mm. You know, that's just such a great, um, great story because, you know, I spoke um, with Alessandro Lubicic yesterday who, Mm. um, you know, is a very um, prolific and prominent artist. Mm. And we were talking about how, you know, in life you just got to take some chances and, you know, you Mm. just don't know what will happen if you um, don't pick up the phone. Yeah. Right? Well, actually, you do know what's going to happen if you don't pick up the phone, which yeah. means nothing. Yeah. Um, and in, you know, so many times we've, uh, you know, I've spoken to some of the guests and they've all said, yeah, I've just, I just picked up the phone or I just reached out. And, and often you'd be surprised at, you know, the amount of yeses that people will give you mm. um, purely because, you know, at the end of the day, uh, they're people too, right? Yeah. And so... You know, just by you guys um, um, doing that, most most people would be too, you know, sort of um, afraid or, yeah. you know, uh, don't want to make a scene or don't, um, yeah. you know, don't want to take that chance because what ifs and, you know, yes, what if she doesn't like it. Yeah. In. So it's really, you know, um, a great, uh, great story of, you know, Sometimes you just need to um, take that chance and see what happens. Right? Yeah. Well, I think we can sometimes all just get stuck in the doing side of things, you know, like getting things, just the everyday easy tasks, but then putting yourself out there, you know, actually doing something of action, like getting ourselves, making a step into the unknown or, you know, I guess we all protect ourselves a little bit because, we don't mm. want to feel rejected, so we tend to stay in safe spots. But it's not until you really put yourself out into that yeah. world, um, the the place of vulnerability, and, and you know, and it often pays off when you step into that zone. Mm. So, you know, after that, um, we start. You guys started being featured in you know everything, mm. um, and you were invited. To, um, you know, to all the fashion weeks and all the really big shows. Yeah. Um, you know, in that time, um, I think uh, one of the years you guy, um, one of you guys uh, became pregnant. Um, or was it you first or oh, was yes. it Heidi? I was first. Yeah. I spent about three to four years, four, yeah, four years pregnant around that time, like 2005. Yeah. I had uh, my children pretty close together, actually. I had yeah, yeah, three yeah. under four. Wow. Mm. That, I mean, that in itself would have been pretty hard work, no? Being a, first of all, being a mother and running a, you know, such a big business. Yeah. And it was the, the time where, you know, you guys are really starting to burst onto the scene and, yes. and um, having, uh, you know, three kids under four. Yeah. How did you do that? I know. <laughs> Well, I had three kids under four and then Heidi had sort of two under three. So, um, And and in one year you were both pregnant at the same time? Yeah, it was just so bizarre (laughs) that I fell pregnant, um, Mm. which I wasn't really planning on becoming. And then Heidi three months later said, 
guess what? I'm pregnant too. So we had mm. this little moment, um, which was really lovely because we both were experiencing that ride together as well. So we just yeah. shared the start of the whole business side of things. And then um, in our personal lives, they seem to be, you know, going at a similar pace. So um, mm. in one way, it was good that we both had children around the same time because I think it would have been quite difficult for the other to understand the demands. Yeah, and no, totally. How, you know, your focus does get, um, I guess, transferred a little bit from business to baby when you're a new mother mm. and it's a really intense time. So yeah. how we did it, I mean, looking back now, I don't know how we did it, but <laughs> it's almost like the busier you get, the more you put in life and and yeah. the more you can do. But I say that now with hindsight, but, you know, we'll probably... We were doing it all, but, at, you know, if we were giving a score out of 10, how well were we doing it? It's probably a different question. Um, mm. I mean, we, I guess we could have done um, motherhood better and we could have done business side better, but we just, we just coped, you know. It was mm. a, a very high stress business yeah. and we didn't have, a lot of time to ourselves and then we got home and, we, you know, we had, oh, well, I had three children um, demanding time and I was pretty, reflecting back now, I can see that I was completely exhausted and really running yeah. on empty and but not having the moment or the space to actually sit and really truly ask myself how I was really feeling so you know you're just you you just you survive and you exist and you know you you keep you've got a team of people at work that keep the wheels rolling and you've got Mm. a team of people at home that help out too so that it all appears to run smoothly but it was there were tough moments for sure yeah I, I bet I mean I have um I have one I have a daughter just um, under two and, oh, mm-hmm. and you know, it's, it's hard enough um, because, you, you know, when you're with them, you uh, requires constant attention as, yes. as you know. So yeah. to think to have, you know, th- three and Boys. also, yeah, right, and, mm. and also trying to run a business where it's not a business where you can kind of, you know, work at, uh, from home. Uh, you, well, you needed then, to be at the shows. Yeah, and, you know. yes. It was very driven by um, Heidi and I and we were the personalities behind the brand. So people wanted to see us, buyers wanted to see us, you know, we were very um, entwined. Like our lives ran around the brand rather mm. than the brand running around our lives. Yeah. And our families ran were, were really scheduled around our work commitments. Of course. Um, back then. So, yeah, well, look, it was definitely very intense, um, but you just do it and there's, you know, a thousand other women out there, or well, millions of women doing it as we speak who are working mm. two jobs and got sure. little ones, single, single mothers. So, you mm. know, I feel sort of extremely fortunate that I have a great partner. He was hands-on with, the yeah. boys and um and I, I had a relatively peaceful sort of home life so I don't know you get through it don't you you yeah. just sort of I, I put on your mm. combat gear and you just sort of go to go to war so to speak you know you just get you just get the job done yeah it's it's funny when you don't have a choice right like um well the perception of no choice you just you just make things happen and when when you have a business that's you know taking off and when you have three kids it's mm. just kind of like well this is my life now and i just have to get on with it because there's you know what what are you going to give up your kids or yeah, are you going to give exactly. up your business it's it's not going to happen right no. um you know uh yeah and 2009 you um you were pregnant with i think your 
uh, third child. And that was the first year you guys missed the New York Fashion Week, right? Yeah, actually, um, 2008, Sorry. I had uh, my last son. Um, and that was also collided with the GFC. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that wow. was quite a year for us. Um, at the time, we had quite a significant loan um, mm. loan to sort of help the business sort of grow to its next stages and it collided yeah. with the GFC and um, we had a pretty hairy year that year. Yeah. Um, but we made it through. Yeah, you you guys ended up getting some um, uh, backers. Yeah, we, end, um, we bought into a great guys who invested in the business and one became a, you know, a general manager, um, David Briskin. So it was great to have an investor who was actually working in the business as well because mm. we really needed help from um, a strategy point of view and, and just another, you know, brain in the business who could yeah. um, relieve some of that pressure and also who had skin in the game too. So sure. it was really wanted it to succeed. So that was a really perfect partnership. Mm. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, what what did the GFC actually uh, affect you guys? Obviously, the sales was it, you know, pretty dramatic and. Um, yeah. Um, oh God, thinking way back then, <laughs> how many years ago was <laughs> it? So long. Um, so yeah, look, it was. I guess sales had it. It was a bit of a perfect storm for us because. Um, we had some product that probably wasn't hitting the mark exactly mm. in the sales. Uh, so, you know, our sales were suffering a little bit. And then, um, but we had fantastic product coming, but it's like a six to nine month cycle in fashion. So yeah. yep. you sort of have to wait, wait your time. Um, so we could, we knew that um, the next season was going to be brilliant. But unfortunately, we just had this season, which was, just a little bit soft and mm. the sales reflected that. So then when the bank saw that, you know, that season, we didn't hit our budget for that season, they started sort Going of investigating back. a little Got bit it. further and saying, well, okay, well, we'll need to pull in a little bit um, of your your credit. So mm. that was quite stressful. Yeah. That was actually one of the most stressful periods of yeah. the business. Um and we were going through extreme growth and, you know, it just yeah. all seemed to hit at one time. So mm. um, you do get through through these things and it all does end up working out how it should, but it, um, it was quite an experience. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, just to have the perfect storm of, you know, sales not hitting, um, sorry, your product's not, um, you know, doing as well as it should and the GFC. Yeah. It really was the perfect storm in that sense. Yeah. Um, was it hard finding these uh, these two guys to come and, you know, uh, help, you, help you guys out? Um, well, actually, interestingly enough, um, David Briskin, who ended up investing rang us one day to talk about, um, just asked us a question about why we had a store in a certain location, <laughs> <laughs> which was great because then we went and met with him and we started having this conversation around retail. Mm. And, you know, David's an excellent retail um, guy. I mean, that's what he does. He grows businesses through retail. Mm. So, um it was it was like he was in the right time. It, you know, he just yeah. We were we've always been quite fortunate that way that we feel like people had just come into our lives at the right time. And once again, it's about taking that opportunity. We mm. we we had the option: should we call him back, or you know, we should we just leave it? We're so busy, we don't have time for it. Or do we call him call him back and? see what he has to say and, yeah. and see what advice he has for us. So we mm. decided to call him back and that's then opened the door to that opportunity and yeah. um, that then flowed on for him also bringing in another partner that he often works with who was the fourth partner in, in the business. Yeah, so, and that was Dan, obviously. Yeah. 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 Um, Daniel, yeah, Beeson, yeah. 
Yeah, because that that whole uh, that time uh, around that time, you know, obviously uh, when they were brought in, and you know, there was already media articles, um, you know, speculating that you guys were. Um, oh, going under. Yeah, going under and all this <laughs> other stuff, right? So, you you know, not only would you have to manage the financial situation, but also when when something like uh, like that comes out, mm. you know, obviously it affects your staff. Yeah. You know, and your staff would have been all wondering, hey, like, are we what's have going a, on? Oh, yeah, it was very unsettling. Yeah. Because also at that time it was um, America was having – you know, huge problems. And mm. we, because a lot of our business was based in the States, yeah. we had this ginormous um, credit list owing to us because yeah. um, a lot of the stockers, a lot of the stores over there just weren't paying, paying yeah. their bills. So that also compounded onto our cash flow. And, I mean, mm. pretty, that you know, if you've got outstanding receivables and you've got a growing inventory list and yeah. um, a GFC hits and people aren't spending as much and you don't have the right product and you can see how very, very quickly you can get in trouble. Yeah. Um, yeah. It doesn't take, you know, it doesn't take a lot if, you know, you've really got to keep your eye on all aspects of the business. But I forget, what was the question you asked me? I've gone off on a ramble. No, that's great. That's that's exactly what <laughs> uh, we like. No, I just, um, you know, wanted to know, uh, you know, how you manage that whole. Uh, oh, how do we manage that period? Oh, yeah. with um, a lot of, with a lot of stress, um, <laughs> few tears. I was pregnant. I was about to have a baby. Yeah. Um, it was how we managed, look, how we managed to get out of that was just, you know, I guess we had a, you know, I guess we had to sit down with all our staff and we had to say, look, Mm. we are going through a bit of a tight bit right now, but, you know, Heidi and I, we are 100% committed to this business. We believe in what Mm. we're doing. We, We know this business is a success and will be a success and you know we will find somebody to come and help fund the business yeah so um we had to really I, and we truly did believe that it wasn't just calming words it was something mm. we knew that the next range was going to be a hit and so um it was just a bit of a patch where we went yeah. through which um you know I, I guess we had to step up um in our leadership and we had to just be there for staff and just have very open communication with them and Mm. assure them that we weren't going anywhere and the business wasn't going to go down the tube. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny when, um, you know, when speculation start and then it's it's kind of like, um, you know, it's kind of like, termites uh the mentality mm. with staff too because the moment there's a little bit of doubt it spreads really quickly and then you know like that the the morale of the staff just goes from happy to really down very quickly yeah you know? and then productivity just goes falls through and then everyone's yeah. just going Ugh. yeah so yeah that would have been you know definitely challenging uncertainty you know it, we all hate it we all sort of sure. just it goes back to just one of our underlying principles, isn't it? Like we all, we always like to be in control of where we're going and mm. what we're doing, but sometimes we just have to release that and just, you know, I guess put it out into the universe and know that it's all going to be out. okay and it will all, always work out for how it's meant to be. Like I always think things happen for a reason and... um. That it, you know, we are meant to be where we are, type of thing. Yeah, yeah. And of course, uh, you know, just the year before that, Heidi, um, you know, was diagnosed with mm. um, breast cancer. Breast cancer. Yeah. And so, you know, you really had a rough two two yeah. years there because here's someone who's your essentially best friend. Yes. And you know, while she was going through treatment, um, you know. Was that was that pretty emotional for you? Um, and you know, on top of that, 
um, it was just down to you to keep the business afloat, right? Uh, yeah, look, it was, um, of course, devastating news that, mm. she, you know, she had breast cancer, but at the same time she was so positive about it and she mm. was like, look, I've got this, so this is not, you know, the, I'm going to have treatment and I'm going to be fine. There's nothing to worry about. I've, you know, I'm really going to um, beat this. So she always had that very positive mentality. Mm. Um it did put strain on the business because when she was going through treatment, obviously we had lost our sort of creative director, so to speak. So she, um, we had to, you know, I guess use other people in the team to ensure that that vision was um, realised. Mm. And But then also she really wanted to be involved in the business. <laughs> like she wasn't even though she was going through treatment at the time and she had a newborn baby. Yeah, yeah. Um, she found out like the day after, right? Yeah. they. That's yeah. crazy. So I think her second daughter was very, um, you know, and it, yeah, t- one day old when she found out that news. So she had a lot on her plate. But, you know, we lived and breathed Sassenbai. It was everything to us. And yeah. um, so sh- she felt like she wanted to keep working through that period. So, um, which led, you know, which I guess was a time where I had to step up a little bit as well. And also the other managers of each department had to step up and, um, you know, take on a little bit more responsibility, responsibility. But at that time we really did have some, um, great team members and, um, as a collective, yeah, we got through it. Yeah, 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 and then and then obviously two thousand eight came and Heidi's back. Welcome to the shit fight. Yeah, <laughs> well, come on back. Welcome in. <laughs> um, that that same year when you obviously brought um the the new partners in mm. was also ironically the 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 same year that um, Madonna and. Beyonce wore your wore your clothes. Oh yeah, I and, know, big. And so, you know, that was obviously a huge um, exposure for for yes. the brand again. Yes. Um, and you know, you guys released um, the black rat uh, leggings. Yes, the black rats. That's what our savior was. The black rats. Because yeah. We knew that they were going to be a hit, and they did become. You know, yeah. like we were like three to four months off releasing those black rats when mm. we were trying to find new funding. So we really had to put a good case forward for the black sure. rats. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. They and saved that, us. And that was so funny because, you know, I think, what, a year and two years after that was launched, I just saw them everywhere. Oh, my God. We, I know? think we must have sold about a million <laughs> pairs of those black rats. <laughs> People still talk about the black rats. Yeah, and I just I uh, I remember because um, I think it was 2009, 2010. I just saw all my friends, mm. and I'm like, "What the hell is going on here?" <laughs> you know, like <laughs> we we turned up to a yeah. You know, I I remember turning up to a uh, a housewarming party or something, and just yeah. like four girls had them on, and I'm just going. What is what what's oh, happening here? I know. people I think they were just <laughs> you know. so comfortable. And let's like And they were cool. They were like, you know, uh flashy and they were oh, reflective. Oh and, yeah, we had yeah, all yeah. we had gold, we had black, we yeah. had shiny, we had matte. Yeah. Um and this was pre you know, sports lux mode. Like there was Mm-mm. nothing you know, people didn't wear their lycra around in 2008. You know, there wasn't these, this big sort of um, like leisure wear that's happening now in the market. Yeah. Um, so the black rat was our legging. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah. it had sort of shirring down the side. So it was a bit of, bit of a fancy, yeah. fancy legging. Mm. And um, look at that. They were just a product that made everyone look good. Yeah. And they were so comfortable. And yeah. you could wear them in joggers. You could wear them with heels. You can wear them. You know, they were very versatile. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, of course, after those, you know, the terrible luck and then, you know, the really yes. extreme reverse in fortune with the exposure the of, with… Um, with Rats, with success. 
Yeah, and also with, uh, you know, Madonna and Beyonce. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So that was, um, you know, at the time when you're in something, you don't spend the time to really reflect on all those wins. Like Mm. to have Beyonce dancing around in one of our dresses was major. But at the time it was like, okay, oh, great. Yeah, good. She's wearing it. But, you know, we didn't, um, I guess... I look back now mm. on all of our achievements and all the people who wore our product and I think, wow, you know, we really did yeah. a great job. But at the time when you're running a business of that size, you just, you hardly, you know, you might take five minutes to think about it, but then you're just on to the, on next, to the next, next. yeah. You're just constantly thinking about the next hundred things that you've got to do. So mm. you don't always get, you don't always take the time to appreciate all the wins. Yeah. Yeah, no, totally. You know, the, yeah, that, that would have been, you know, for, for um, an Australian looking at an Australian brand and being featured with, you know, essentially they're the untouchables of music now, right? Mm. Um, you know, that was you know, super proud of uh, proud of what you guys did because you know he's a, like a small brand in Alexandria. And, yeah, I know, you know on the world stage. It's, yeah, it's, um, and I it's get really that amazing. feeling about brands now when I see you know them, you know, big names wearing Australian designers, and I just think you know, mm. good on them because it does take it does take a lot of work and a lot mm. of um, relationship building. Um, to make that happen. Like yeah. you just rarely do you send a dress to a celebrity and they just put it on and, and wear it, you know. Yeah, so it does, exactly. it does take a lot of time and relationship building to forge that relationship and to make that actually mm. happen. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's something, um, you know, just going back to uh, – other Australians um, doing that too. We we're surprisingly um, good at punching above our um, our weight in just anything mm. in in this country. Um, considering we have such a small population, mm. we always seems uh, seem to get to the top of a particular industry. Yeah. Um, in most industries, we're like really up there. Yeah. And I don't know whether it's um, you know. Maybe our, um, you know, like a small population syndrome, or because we're so small in population yeah. terms, we need to be. We loud. need to, yeah, we need to stand <laughs> out, or we need to really be above everyone else. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I do think Australians are well liked from mm. around the globe, and I think that really helps. I think people are quite curious about our country, and because we are so far away. Um, it might seem a little quite exotic to yeah. um, foreigners. And um, I think in one way, because we are so isolated, it, you know, perhaps helps us to become even more creative because we're mm. not constantly comparing ourselves to our neighbours, so to speak, and we just, you know, I guess you can get more focused here when there's not so much noise about. Mm. Um Maybe. I mean, I, I don't know why. I think we, yeah, perhaps we do have a bit of small country syndrome where we yeah, like yeah. to, I think it's sort of our Aussie way too, isn't it? Like we just, we give things a go. We're not too serious that mm. if it doesn't work out, you know, we don't fall to pieces. It's, I think we do have a quite a battling personality, personality you know, like. Yeah, we'll yeah, absolutely. Give it a go. We're, we work hard. We're not. You know, mm. we're not lazy and I think we we do support entrepreneurs and yeah. we are pretty supportive of each other, I feel. No, totally. And and I think there's um, less uh, heritage and culture. Uh, mm. well, not culture, le- less, uh, what's the word, um, tradition, right? Yes. So, you know, in our winemaking, we've, we've not, you know, we've not gone, you know, here's how we've always done it and this is how we're always going to do it. We, we've we just gone out there and said, well, let's try this. Let's try that. You yeah. Know, and Yeah, we don't stick to the rules. Like, yeah. I think we like to break them a little bit, don't we? Yeah. We're yeah. the rogues. Yeah, no, it's, it's really <laughs> good. Um, 
you know, tell me about, you know, your relationship with Heidi during throughout all this time. I mean, you know, you I, I read somewhere that you guys have never had a disagreement ever. I, I just find that really hard to believe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've had a few little um little you know, nickels here and there mm. as as per it's it's a bit like a relationship. Yeah. Um, it you of course there's always gonna be it's a bit of a give and take scenario and you've mm. got to pick your battles. And we did have a particularly um uh, particularly good relationship in this in the sense that we both respected each other. We both came from same values. We both had very similar ideas around money, how the business should be working. Like we were in there for the same reasons. Sure. So I think the fact that we were aligned in a lot of our beliefs and and the vision for the business, then that allowed um, our working partnership to flourish. Yeah. Um, and we, you know, implicitly trusted each other. We had each other's back. We never, you know, we were always watching out for each other. And mm. We were a force together. Sure. And I think that, and we were very yin and yang and mm. um, that balanced out the relationship quite nicely. And, yeah. you know, we knew each, we knew we, what we were both good at and what we weren't good at. And I think once you sort of sort out all that, then mm. you can work quite well together. Of course. But it's not for everyone. You know, I wouldn't go in business with um, many other friends. And even after we did leave Sassenbad and then we were talking about doing a new fashion brand, we did talk to each other about perhaps being partners again. But mm. In one sense, we were both very protective of what we had achieved together and, sure. and because we did end on such a good note, mm. um, we didn't want to jeopardise that at all and we wanted to make sure that, you know, in this case that our, the friendship did come, become first because when, sure. um, when you do work together, you do end up talking a lot of business and, and not a lot of pleasure so sure. now we're you know we share giggles and we share yeah. <laughs> stories about our time together and you know how we you know I guess in some way we always felt like we winged it a little bit and we didn't mm. we still talk about how you know we can't quite believe we got to where we got to yeah but um I think yeah so now it's now it's lovely Heidi's doing her own um her own fashion and art and, um, mm. we, you know, we're both on to new adventures and I think it's beautiful that we've evolved into our own uh, our own selves now and, um, you know, we're doing it our way. Yeah. You know, lots of people don't get out um, uh, like the way you, you do. No, you lots know. of people do not. And even even when there's, uh, a, you know, a happy ending. Yeah. Um, most, uh, you know, a lot of people don't want to ever have anything to do with the other person ever again. Yeah. You know? um, and that's even at a, you know, at a happy level. So yeah. I'm really, you know, really happy for you guys that you guys have, you know, kept your relationship, um, you know, yeah. intact. I mean, it'd be hard not to. We shed so many yeah. highs. We shed so many lows. Like for 16 years, we were thick of thieves, you know, we sure. were in, we were in life together. So mm -hmm. we shared, um, you know, marriages, births of children. We, mm. you know, buying our first homes, yeah. we had, we just shared so much. So we'll always be deeply connected over that time. Mm. Um, and to be able to share a success, um, with each other too was, is, you know, when we actually ended up selling the business and, um, we received, you know, we got, I guess, financial freedom. That was sure. nice to be able to share that with each other as well. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's obviously well known that you, your role in the business was, you know, finance and um, maybe running of the business and hers was um, creative. Mm. Um, well, look. Sort of? <laughs> <laughs> It evolved like that because 
I did a de- degree in business and I studied accountancy. So when we were first starting off mm-hmm. and Heidi could draw yeah. and um, so w- when there was just two of us in a, a room probably, you know, the size of this, yeah. we uh, divide and conquered sort of thing. So I ended up taking on um, the bookkeeping and the, you know, I guess the production and the, the more of the um, running of the business, so to speak. Mm-hmm. But then as we grew the business and we got people to come in and take roles, um, you know, to take sort of more managerial roles, then I became a little bit more floating across the business, which was a little bit hard in, in some senses because I didn't have an absolute exact role like Heidi had creative director as her role so she knew exactly what that involved and where yeah it started and where it stopped whereas when you're floating across a business like I did you know I guess um what did we title we made up the title brand director so I oversaw a lot of the brand um uh, aspects of the brand rather um, so I would dip my toe into a bit of design when Heidi needed to talk about, you know, a colour palette or sure. some shapes or, you know, I would sit in fittings when we'd be fitting collections. So I was probably uh, very close to Heidi and her design, her designing. But, yeah, um, yeah I, I sort of towards the end floated Floated. I was a floater. <laughs> You're a floater. <laughs> <laughs> I floated around. That would have been a great... Uh... Yeah. Great title. Yeah, floater. Mm. Brand floater. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, when you guys had um, some of those niggles, because I, um, you know, I was, um, um, I've worked a long time and my old business partner was the, the creative. And mm. did you ever find um, any difficulties sort of, balancing creative and um, making it happen because, you know, uh, creativity can be kind of limitless, right? Like, Mm. you know, was it hard for you to maybe sometimes step in and go, no, that's going to cost us too much or that's not realistic in that particular design? Yeah, look, I guess um, Heidi was very emotional with her designing, like, Mm. You know, sometimes as a designer, you can, um, you get attached to a design. Of course. And yeah. because I wasn't at that, you know, I, I I wasn't at the beginning of the process. When I saw things that when we had our um, range review, where that's when the whole collection was made and it was sitting in the design room mm. and Heidi and I would sort of go through and edit the collection um, and it was sometimes product that she really, really, really loved. She was like, oh, no, but it's nearly there and it's going to be looking like this and then it's going to be. And then, yeah, yeah. And then there was times where I said, you know, I said, well, look, I, I'm not sure whether that is the absolute strongest piece. Mm. But at the end of the day, it was always um, Hyde's decision in that design department if, if she felt like she wanted it in the range, then I always respected that and, and gave her the last yeah. say on that. Um, so I think it's about just working out the boundaries, working and being really clear about who makes what decisions and when mm. and, um, you know, who where the buck stops. So if, if, the, if, if that's a little bit murky, then that's when the problems come in. You know, do yeah. I get the last say? Do you get this last say? Mm. If we can't agree, then who's going to be the third person to help resolve this? Did Did you have a third person to do some of those? Um, those well, hands? in that case, we would probably, you know, we by then we had departments, and you know, regarding depending on what it was, whether it was a production uh, issue or whether it was um, a sales. Mm. Um, uh, thing then would get the head of sales in and would say well, you know what do you think about this piece do you love it do you don't like it so but normally we worked most of those out together so yeah. we didn't it, we sometimes if you involve too many people then it becomes um yeah a little too many people involved and it can get diluted yeah yeah 
I mean, that's, yeah, it's such a great, um, you know, uh, great uh, story to hear that you guys um, really managed that uh, aspect uh, of decision making really well. Because, you know, how often have you heard really bad um, conclusions to businesses mm. or stories of uh, falling outs between friends? And, yeah. You know, and normally just over lack of communication or. Yeah. yeah. And so it's really refreshing to hear that you guys, you know, really made it work and you came out the other side uh, with a happy ending. So, yes. it, you know, it can work. It certainly can work. Mm. Yeah. And I think, um, I think if you go in with sort of a lot of sort of understanding and trust and, um, mm. and that, you, you know, not to, you know, you've got to compromise the whole journey is a, compromise you know I might see this shirt in pink but Heidi wanted it in blue and it's like well you know you've just got to know when to step back and when to you know like which which fights to fight really and what's really important you know is is Mm. uh, is an argument over a pink or blue shirt really worth the friendship (laughs) or the partnership so yeah sure you've got to sort of bring it into perspective yeah and it's really um really amazing that you you could always you know look at that and go okay well bigger picture mm. Mm. yeah and so the 2016 um you embarked on a journey of uh alcohol free oh yes yes so I'd, we'd left sassen by by then so yeah. 2014 14, yeah. we sold that business and mm. then became free was was it weird not being, being able and not having to do, you know? Oh, it took a huge adjustment. Like 2015 was yeah. really unsettling because we'd gone from every day having like 250 emails in our <laughs> inbox to waking up with just sort of marketing material from people. So, you know, like yeah. junk email. So, um it was a big adjustment to, and a big, we had to, un, well, I had to unwind from the mm. hype. It took a lot of time to decompress our, um, decompress my, well, body and thought and just I had to really retrain on myself uh, into this slower, slower pace of living yeah. because I'd gone from, Waking up, jumping out of bed, getting into the office, meetings back to back, leaving at mm. five thirty, getting home for the nanny, releasing the nanny, then doing the kids, you know, then yeah. finally at nine o'clock, ten o'clock, getting into bed. Yeah. So it was. I really had to retrain myself and and do a lot of sort of soul searching, I guess, to work out where I was going and now what was my relevance in. I guess. I mean, I knew I was always. A mother, so that was. Um, I still had that role, but what was my professional life looking yeah. like? You know. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if you found found the same thing, but I definitely found that when I um, left the business, you know, you get you know for such a long time, you get defined mm. as um, assassin bide. Yeah, right, and you get such a you are one part of, you know, one out of two of Assassin Bite and that's who you were yeah. for such a long time, you know, 14, 14 or 15 years, whatever it was. Yeah. And all of a sudden you're no longer, you know, that person. Yeah. And, you know, did you did you have a bit of identity uh, crisis? Oh, of course, yes. I did. I know I did, yeah. I had a huge identity crisis but not, I guess, also in the sense that we were – you know, for 16 years I'd been wearing Sassen Bide mm. and then all of a sudden I had this freedom to <laughs> choose any brand I wanted in the world. And I was like, okay, what, what is my look? Yeah, well, I, never, know, I never thought about that. Yeah, wow. What, who, you know, which brands are I going to buy? What, what, what is my new aesthetic? What am I, you know, and I guess um, over the years as I, you know, as, as I got de so to speak, I, I, you know, I started putting away the sassambide because I felt like 
I needed a new identity mm. and I needed to be me, not not Sass from Sass and Bide. So it was a, a really quite an interesting time, also coupled with the fact that you were no longer really needed mm. or in demand or, you know. Um, so it was definitely a time of adjustment and a, and a time of personal growth and um, and reflection. Yeah. Mm. yeah, because, you know, your industry is just full on, right? Like, um, you know, launches and yeah, parties yeah. and, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of drugs and alcohol flowing at, at, at these events. Mm. And I'm not saying that you guys, you know, did the drugs and alcohol, but, you know, being in that environment, uh, yes. that fast pace, the glam, the cameras and the media and the celebrities yeah. and all that. And then all of a sudden, you know, nothing. nothing. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, hello. It must be bizarre, Remember right? Remember me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, look, though, with that being said, um, we, I, I certainly was at a point where I had done, I felt like I had done my time mm. in that um, whole scene. Like I, we only, I sort of, we only really ever had one foot in it anyway. Like even, we could have easily got very distracted with the parties and the mm. events and the launches and you know, the, there was one every night if we really wanted to, but we would do the ones that we that were crucial or, you know, that were our partners, like, like a partnering, um, like a Vogue or someone like that. But sure. um, so, yeah, it was, it was, um, I didn't really, really miss the social aspect because, and this is what really started getting me into um, thinking about doing my alcohol free time because mm. I really didn't love being in crowds and I didn't love turning up to events and I really did get a lot of social anxiety. So yeah. Yeah. I ended up drinking at those events just to get me through sure. the events. So um, when, you know, after having a couple of years off um having left Sass and Bide and having a couple of years to really reflect on myself, which you need that time because, mm. as you know, running a business, you don't get a lot of time to um, do any personal work. Mm. Um, so that gave me a bit of time to reflect on my behaviour and and where I was and where I wanted to be. And that started my journey into sort of a bit more of the wellness space and um, especially around my use with alcohol and why I use why what my triggers were for mm. alcohol. Yeah, you said um you said once that, you know, because you were so um uh sorry, big you you um drank because you then lost control. Oh. Uh, and you enjoy <laughs> you enjoyed that element. You, you know, obviously you had to be in control all the time for for your you know, for the yeah. business yeah. and for your staff and yes. for everyone else. Yeah. Um, was that part of it? Um, I guess um, I'm, I think what I was meaning by that statement was that I drank to um, relieve the pressure yeah. of, of, of having such a big business like that and having, mm. um, you know, young children. And I felt like it, it, it gave me an escape. And it was the, you know, the perfect um, substance to sort of numb my brain and yeah. all the thoughts that were running around in there. So that's, yeah, that's what I meant by mm, that, mm, it, mm. that losing control. It just allowed me to forget about all the, the stress mm. and demands. Yeah, I can, uh, you know, I, I definitely can relate to that. I um I got into a really unhealthy habit uh, while I was running the business where I would um you know go to bed before like to go to sleep I would have you know a a, a glass of whiskey I must be like ten mm. drinks in there right like it's mm. filled to the top uh, and straight <laughs> every night and yeah. you know I used to go through like 
a bottle of whiskey maybe in two days, three days. Oh, ouch. Right? And it, it got to a point where it was that to go to sleep and then in the morning I would have eight, you know, espressos, like, right. you know, four double espressos yeah. to, like, wake up. Yeah. And, you know, it was super unhealthy. Yeah. And, I'm, you know, I'd had, <laughs> hate to think how much damage I did to my uh, my liver. And, yeah, no, I can, you know, I totally can relate to, you know, that that vice to, you know, unwind. Yeah. I guess because it's so sociable, socially acceptable as well, mm. alcohol, mm. It, it's an easy substance to turn to, to relieve yeah. stress, to, you know, you think it makes you sleep better. You think, you know, you, you, you use it to um, sort of numb your feelings, I guess. For, yeah even if it's just for an hour or two. Mm, mm, mm. Um, and, you know, I was a bit the same. I knew I was always very health conscious. I w- really wouldn't drink anything during the week. But yeah. then come Friday or Saturday night, it was- I'd have this <laughs> roaring of a session where I, you know. Game on. Game on. And mm. which always sort of led to the next day of feeling, you know, absolutely terrible and just... Yeah. You know, lethargic and, you know, having a bad hangover. And I just thought, you know, this is really not, I live so healthy during the week. It's so contradictory to my wellness sort of um, plan for myself. So I started digging a little mm. bit further into mm. that. And it all came to a, you know, uh, a head when you had blackouts. Um, yeah. When you were drinking. Yeah. And that, uh, you know, you said that was really the turning point for you to. Um... Yeah. I think um, when you start being curious about something, and for me it was alcohol, I started really um, paying attention to what it was really physically doing to me. Mm. I like blackout. So I'd wake the next, you know, I'd wake at three o'clock in the morning with anxiety and yeah. sort of shame about what I said and what I did and, mm. you know, it would be this constant voice in my head going, why did you do that? Why? And it, it sometimes could last two to three days of just this sort of shame around um, why I had to drink to excess like that and mm. often um, you feel like you're the only person in the world going through that. Like yeah. you think. Does anybody else even have blackouts? Does anybody have anxiety? And yeah. and then it wasn't until really I started talking about it that um, I worked out that actually it's it's super common and, you know, mm. we're all battling it or battling something in one something, way or yeah. another. Yeah. That must have been super difficult to not drink for a year. I can't. Like, <laughs> it's just. I'm not even picturing it. <laughs> oh, God, I know. Well, look, I was so fed up with myself. You know, when you just, it's like if you tell every if every morning you say you're not drinking coffee and then you go back and you have a coffee but you just don't have one coffee, you have five yeah, coffees. Yeah. So there comes a point where you just, you get so sick of your own stories and, and mm. you know, making a promise to yourself and you don't keep it. And I just... um you know, once again, it was a night where I said I was just going to have one or two drinks and it ended up having, you know, five or five drinks or, you know, martinis. <laughs> yeah, and, right, right, right. <laughs> and I can't remember the night. So oh, then geez. I just yeah. woke up and I'm saying, okay, this is it. I, I, I had reached the point where I was just, yeah, I had, yeah. I was just so fed up with myself, with my behaviour, with feeling so badly about myself. You know, mm. I just I just knew a, a change had to happen because yeah. um, I couldn't go on with, with how it was going and I knew it was a problem. I knew it was affecting my family. I knew it was affecting myself and um, I just, I took the dive. Yeah. I just had to, uh, for me it was, I had to do 365 days because I knew that I fundamentally had to change my relationship with alcohol and I needed time to research. I needed time to um, actually 
you know, give myself space to reflect on my feelings and, and you know, work out why I drank so much and just mm. do some work on myself, basically. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> that's, that's like such a long time because, um, you know, the Australian culture's drink, you know, has always been a drinking culture. Oh, well, globally, it's yeah. uh, like there's, you know, you go to weddings, there's drinking, christenings, yeah. drinks, first birthdays, drinks. <laughs> yeah, first you know, birthdays. That's the uh, that's the best one. You're like celebrating a child's birthday and yeah. here's the champagne. And here's the champagne. <laughs> so it is mm. everywhere mm. we go, It we are surrounded by it. Our culture is based on alcohol and, um, you know, and, and when you start really tuning into all the the marketing that's based around alcohol, you can see why yeah. um, as a nation it's so sociably acceptable. But, um, you know, it is a drug and it, it, mm. it is sort of, it's a highly addictive. So, yeah, um, yeah look, it, it's, it's a hard, it's hard to start it. But, um, well, I mean, it wasn't that hard for me to start it because I was, I was, I'd reached that point where mm. I was like, okay, I just, I am done. But for me, the harder part came towards the end where I was like, oh, maybe I could just have one. But then, you know, there's that fading bias effect theory mm. where you can only, you start only remembering all the good things yeah. about alcohol and you forget all the bad Absolutely, things yeah. about it. So, um, yeah, that it was more towards the end. But then, you know, half really you do forget about it and you you break a habit and mm. you know at five o'clock you're no longer thinking about a drink. You so used to then grabbing an alternative that um yeah, it becomes a it becomes a pleasure in a way and you get so much time back and mm. you get so clear about who you are and you know where you want to go and yeah. um, clarity of thought is just so, you know, great to experience. And, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a really good year. And, and because I had announced it to my social media following, I felt like everyone knew I was on board. So I was, I was sort of left alone. I didn't have to explain it to every single person I went out to dinner with because they knew what I was doing sure. and they were supportive and, you know, my friends supported me through that and as yeah. did my partner and, um, yeah, close ones. Yeah. I mean, drinking is the vice, right? Like you, you could be eating, you could be cigarettes, you could be, mm. um, you know, drugs, you could be. Yeah, whatever corn, it is, food, whatever, whatever. Yeah. you know, um, it's really, you've got to work out, you know, what you're doing it for, like yes. what are you trying to hide from or what are you trying to avoid or, what, yeah. you know, um, and. It's, it is, it's normally mm. a, a, a emotion. It's, it's, they say that you're either, either um, hungry, angry, lonely or um, tea. Um, can't remember the last one. But, yeah, it's normally attached sure. to an emotion. Mm. Yeah. And so once you work out, you know, what you're actually doing it for, yeah, it's really easy to, um, you know, uh, do some work around that yeah. and yeah. then all of a sudden your relationship with whatever you, it is you're addicted to uh, or is the vice in your case, alcohol becomes so much, um, it becomes different. Yeah. Um, you know, and of course during that period, uh, you, you caused uh, a little bit of controversy with, you know, uh, posting something and then all of a sudden posting, uh, yourself in front of, um, champagne bottles. Uh, and of course. Oh yes. That's because I do judge the Verve Clico yeah. business woman of the year. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing that for eight years and I love doing that. Yeah. And even though it is an alcohol company mm. and I am actually really conscious these days not to um, glamorize alcohol in any way. But the thing is with Madame Clicquot, she 
was a woman and she was an entrepreneur and, mm. and you know, she turned that champagne business around. So that is, um, that's the background to that. That's yeah. why I continued doing that even though it is a alcohol company. But it was funny because people didn't read the post at all and they just like judged it for the fact that you were in front of champagne bottles. Mm. And, you know, that, yeah, that's the thing with um, social media and uh, media these days. That people are so quick to judge without actually. Yeah, they don't take the time to read. No. They just, it's, it's people crazy. love a good go, you know, like they <laughs> yeah. love finding something to take a go at. But you know what, deep down I know what I'm doing. Yeah. In this, you know, I feel really comfortable um, still with, that post and as you say you know no one really bothered to read it to the end well those people who criticized and that's fine you know like if they want to spend their or waste their time Mm. sort of making a noise out of something that really isn't anything to talk about then (laughs) go for it (laughs) it's a great way to look at life um any um advice for um, people in your industry and um, uh, people in general. Um, who, <laughs> people in general. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, people who are running a business maybe um, are also in, in a journey of giving up something. Yeah. Uh, uh, any advice? Oh, gosh, I've got lots of advice. Go for it. I, I, I Love always, to hear them. Oh, look, I think, um, well, we should probably break this, the, the, Advice up a little bit. So, uh, well, if we start with someone trying to give up a addictive substance, then I think the advice there is just to know that you're not alone. There's mm. lots of people out there to help you, and don't do it. Al- you know, don't do it alone because there's something so comforting in having a community with you. Um, um, uh, and also that you know it is hard at the beginning but it's so worth the effort and mm. as you see your life transform then you know feeling good is the yeah. addictive part of it you know like you really love um for me waking up fresh every morning is is my everything so that's what keeps me motivated and um with you know drinking sort of mindfully and I just never want another hangover again Mm. no thanks um but um I guess it's about I mean look I think it's about knowing who you are and knowing what you want from life and being sort of finding yourself and what authenticity means to you and whether that's sort of trying to give up something or whether that's starting your own business it's really important to know what you stand for, what you don't stand for, surround yourself with good like-minded people, you know, create a a great um, supportive work place with people that you can trust mm. and, um, and you know, have fun on the way too. You know, you can't, it's, it's you're going to have your days that are <laughs> – Super exciting. And then you're just going to have days where you feel completely at the grind. And that's, you know, that's life, isn't it? Like Absolutely. we're not always going to feel happy 100% of the time. We're going to have the sad days, but mm. all the days that are, are you're feeling down, but it makes the, the up days feel even better. So totally. Um, I just think don't be afraid of your emotions either and listen, listen to your body. And if, if something, I really run on instinct. Like if I know that something keeps playing in my head or I just I just know that um that that's the right thing, you know. I really listen to to instinct and you can't underestimate that. It's all sort of within us, you know. We we do sure. we do instinctively know what's right. Sometimes we just get lost with all the noise that surrounds us. Mm. Yeah, that's that's totally true. And what about um, for anyone who's in the fashion industry? What's the you know what's one really uh, helpful piece of advice for someone who's you know just starting out or even mm. going through the um, the beginnings oh. of everything? Well, look, I always and I do speak to young designers who are um, starting off 
on the journey, I just, I always speak, you know, I always say to them, you know, just if, if you want to just design, then maybe you need to be a designer. But if, if you want to be an entrepreneur, you've really got to realize that design is 10% mm. of your role. You're going to be in finance, you're going to be in sales, you're going to be over marketing, you're going to be, you know, you really will be spread across all the business. So um, I think it's really important to make that clear division of, on what you want to do. And um, I mean, not that I want to kill anybody's dreams, of course, but I, I just, I think people get all stuck at that front end of the business that it's all sort of design glamour parties. Mm. But in fact, that it is only you know, 10% of yeah. the job. It's such a tiny proportion of the job. But um, but I think, you know, as long as you know who, you know, going back, who who you're designing for, your client, mm. um, that you have a point of difference in the market, that you know what your brand stands for, who mm. are you, who, you know, what, what your brand voice is, then um, you've got a really good chance. And a lot of hard work and yeah. persistence. A lot of yeah. Persistence and courage and you no, know, you've got to be brave to put yourself out there. And you said uh, as as you said once, uh, you know, don't want to design for the wrong reasons um and for other motivating reasons, but design for like um, you know, what you believe in, right? Yeah. I mean you can't be everything to everyone, you know, you've, you've really got to find your niche and, and what, you know, narrow down on that because, you know, I guess there's that saying, isn't it? The quicker somebody doesn't like you, the better, because then that mm. takes them out of the picture and you, you just keep narrowing down on the people who really, really appreciate what you're doing. So you yeah. find your, find your audience, find your tribe and, and stick with them and, and don't try to sort of please everyone yeah because that that will be a disaster unless they're sarah jessica parker then probably design something for them. <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah of course <laughs> yeah no thank you so much for um for joining us oh that's been and my pleasure 